everybody. Thank you for joining us on this uh, edition of Poetry with Prakriti. Uh, Prakriti Foundation, very briefly, is an arts and culture NGO in Chennai, uh, 1998, and it's a space where scholars, researchers, artists, critics, poets, filmmakers, creative people of all kinds have been able to present their work uh, to those who engage with it on serious terms. Poetry with Prakriti is one of the annual festivals that uh, Prakriti conducts. It features both eminent and emerging poets from India and other parts of the world as well. Uh, the beautiful part of it is that it's not all in one venue. It's in a variety of venues and a variety of non-conventional venues in a school, in an art gallery, in uh, you know, a bus station, in a shopping mall, things like that. But of course, uh, 2020 being what it was, Poetry with Prakriti couldn't happen in December. Uh, but Prakriti Foundation decided then to take the festival online on Zoom, like so many others have done, and to have the festival run right through the year. So the first three Saturdays of every month are poetry, a different poet each time. And we've had uh, people like uh, Keki Daruwala, Perumal Murugan, Priya Sarukai Chabra, Dhani Shasen, K. Sri Lata, Ranjit Hoskote, Charan Rudramurthy, Anupama Raju, Bina Sarkar, uh, Arundhati Subramaniam in, in the weeks past. Uh, this will continue on until October of uh, 2021. The, in the years that Prakriti has been having the festival, there have been, of course, a huge variety of poets who have come in. And sadly, of course, uh, life being what it is, some of those uh, poets are not no longer with us. Uh, one of them uh, is Margaret Mascarenhas, who passed away in 2019. Uh, Margaret was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA, and she lived in many parts of the world, including uh, Venezuela, California, Bombay, and Goa, where part of her family has roots and where she, uh, where she died. She worked as a correspondent, a columnist, an editor, lecturer, art critic, a curator, novelist, and a creative writing teacher. And she was also an activist, deeply invested in Goa. Also in Goa, she was the founding director of the Sunaparanka uh, Goa Center for the Arts and founding director of the Blue Shore Silent Prison Art Program. She uh, wrote two novels, Skin and the Disappearance of uh, Irene Dos Santos, and a volume of poetry, Triage, Casualties of Love and Sex, a poetry collection. So when she passed away in 2019, she had been working on a third novel and collections of poetry and short fiction. Margaret appeared at uh, Prakriti, Poetry with Prakriti, in 2013. Today, what we've done is there's a number of people who've known Margaret at various phases of her life who will be reading from her work, poems each one of us has selected. And uh, I'm not going to introduce uh, them because, for one, most of them are very well-known people. And uh, for, for two, this is about uh, Margaret. And we're here primarily because uh, we love Margaret and we miss her. So without uh, further ado from me, first, I mean, you know, thank you for Prakriti for thinking of this lovely gesture of uh, paying tribute to poets who have appeared at the festival in the past. This is the first of, I think, three or four readings uh, for, po for poets who have uh, passed on. And uh, thank you for inviting us all in. I see that Ranveer is here, so uh, we can also thank him in person at the end. But let, let us start now, and we'll go uh, with, uh, we we'll start with Kartika. Kartika was at uh, uh, Marsha's publisher with Triage. So Kartika, if you could go with the poems that you have chosen. Peter, didn't we want to start with Maria? Did we get that wrong? Or it's okay to start with me? Okay, shall I start then? Right. Uh, I want to say just a couple of lines before reading the poems. Um, I did have the singular good fortune of uh, being Margaret's editor on Skin, her first novel, and on Triage. And the experience, as you can imagine, was a great deal of fun apart from being uh, about the work itself. Uh, 
with skin, for instance, I remember clearly that she was so sure of what she wanted on the cover. She wanted a Dayanita Singh image, which she had identified. And uh, she made sure that that's what went on the cover. And when we published Triage many years later, uh, there was the event we did for her in Delhi at a, a reading that we had organized. I remember she sat back with me right at the back and she told me what her body was going through and what lupus was all about and how it affected her. Uh, and that conversation is still very fresh in my head. Uh, she is someone I miss a great deal and I, I don't know if reading her makes up for this loss in any small way, but I'd like to think she is listening to. The first poem, therefore, is When You Wouldn't Hear Me. Finally, when you wouldn't hear me, I thought, I'm ready to perform the autopsy now. Excise your smug inattentiveness, cut your rationalizations into ribbons and plant upon your lips a souvenir kiss. I have learned where to leap when the carpet is pulled, how to balance on the edge of a cliff, how to ride the waves in a storm. Momentarily, I consider salvation, but there are too many animals missing from this ark. Monsoon. Outside, the monsoon showers splatter the roof tiles and color the sky slate. I have lost my appetite for obliquy and the keys to the kingdom as a consequence. I have chewed on gravel instead. There is no voice to stop me. No ambulance will appear. Stone becomes sand, sand becomes glass, and its shard is lodged in my throat. Inside, I have lit the kerosene lamp and burnt all the letters, even the letters of your name. And finally, because this is also Margaret's voice in my head, passive aggressive. We'll be careful with each other, you said, but then you forgot to feed the unicorns. I am not a thing or an area. I will not remain quietly in a corner by the wall. Don't take anything for granted. If you eat raw onions, you must move to the far side of the bed. Thank you. Thank you, Kartika. Uh, next up is Margaret's uh, neighbor, Maria, Maria Kulta. Maria, could you uh, please unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Perfectly. Please go ahead. Yeah, well. Thank you for including me in this tribute to Margaret, whose absence is a constant presence in my life and particularly on this veranda, which she adored. And she loved the secrecy of our meetings. I think very few people knew how close we were and she liked to keep it that way. She inspired me and dropped in here, or came invited, uninvited. She loved my tea, tea stores. We loved to booze together and gossip together. And I had health issues before her problem started. But till the very end, when she was even having her treatment, she insisted on driving herself here because she knew how much I valued her company. It's too emotional for me to talk about Margaret or even read the poetry because she's still so present here. So I've requested Rosalind to read a poem I've chosen. So thank you, Rosalind. And thank you for including me here in this very wonderful and very deserved program for Margaret. Thank you. Uh, so Maria chose um, Blue Muse, and I'm going to read it. I write the blues and try not to slip on the discordant notes that crash to the floor of our page, merging sensibility with common sense. I persist with soft beat and light touch of pen, knowing what it is to kneel in deep flat, transfixed and paralyzed, knowing what it is to hang by the cord of an unfinished masterpiece. Thank you. 
Thank you, Maria, and thank you, Runsa. Uh, next uh, person to read was someone who uh, couldn't make it today because she's dealing with a family health situation, but she recorded her poem and uh, a couple of poems uh, of Margaret's writing that she's doing, which we're going to play the video for you. Uh, along with the video, I've put together a few photographs of, uh, that Nilanjana has of Margaret and photographs that I've taken of that part of Goa, as well as a few uh, pictures of Nilanjana uh, Nilanjana had taken of Margaret. So, uh, Harish, could you play Nilanjana Roy's video, please? Sorry, we seem to have a bit of a tech glitch. So we'll come back uh, to Nilanjana once we work that out. And uh, I'd like to ask uh, Sario to please uh, uh, come up next. Uh, Dr. Sario Doshi is known Margaret since Margaret was a toddler. And I let her uh, continue on from there. Uh, Dr. Doshi? Uh, Dr. Doshi, you're on mute right now. Can you hear me now? Perfectly. Please carry on. Perfectly. Okay. Thank you all for inviting me. And I'm really very happy to be part of this uh, group, which is going to be talking about Margaret and sort of commemorate her memory, which all of us have very, very vibrant memories about. Margaret was uh, the daughter of a friend of my husband's and I have known her ever in Ann Arbor where I was also studying. I have known her since she was born and uh, she spent a lot of time in India and some of it with us in Bombay. So she stayed with us and then she helped me become, uh, you know, work with me at uh, the, as an editorial team member at Marg magazine and uh, in any case she was like a daughter for us she was always in her home when in Bombay and it was terrible to see her suffer because she came for the last time to Mumbai and she went to the hospital from here but you know her spirit was always high she was always always there to talk to us and to to laugh and to joke and to have a drink and spend time in the evening despite all the suffering she was going through. And it was it was a shock to hear when we went to see her the last time in Goa. And she said, I have only two weeks to live. And, you know, I really didn't believe that would be the case because there she was with, you know, moving around the house and all. And truly, two weeks later to the day she passed away. So it was a very sad moment for us and her memories keep coming up to for me. And you know, she was really like a daughter. I myself don't have a daughter, I have a number of nieces. So she could be a niece or she could be a daughter. She was a friend, she was a companion, she was a colleague, everything. So she was really very important to us. So I'm going to read two poems that uh, have been uh, uh, sent to me. And uh, the first one is reciprocity, derived from Neruda. If you cherish me less each dawn, I will cherish you less. If your thoughts stray too far away, mine will seek what lies before me. If inside me you fantasize another, 
I will use my own imagination. If you set sail and leave me beached upon the sand, I will be gone when you return. I will take my kite and fly in the opposite direction, for I am more Pablo than Penelope. If you forget me, I will forget you. Shows the strength in her character, you know, through her poems. The other poem that I'm going to read is Dharamsala. Eye of Caracal, damp sapphire, the threshing of the harvest, snow-capped pyramids in the distance. We sit on wet logs in tall grass, watching an ochre and violet sky. In such moments, trust of that nature lies between us, like a bowl of hot soup on a table made of ice. I mean, some of the imagery is really just marvelous and so unusual. Thank you for asking me to read this. Very much, Dr. Darshan. Uh, we were supposed to go in alphabetical order, and I uh, put my step with being a little disconcerted by that video not going up. It was uh, so. Uh, I'm about my apologies for that. Next up, uh, Rosalind, uh, Rosa, over to you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. I'm trying to make sure it's. Um, um, yeah. It's hard to talk about Margaret because she has been such a uh, foundational part of my life when I think about like trying to. Um, arrive at a sense of my identity as a person, as a writer, as someone of liberation. And I think of Margaret very much as someone I happen to, I mean, if I just look at the screen right now, you know, I can see one box, I see Vinita, and I know how Vinita led me to Margaret, led me to Maria, led me to Tishani, everything is all like this, this wonderful, nebulous uh, nature to all our entanglements. And Mar Margaret was for me very much this very important note that helped me um, figure out who I was and who I wanted to be. And I think of her as my feminist godmother. Um, and the last memory I have of her was really when she was in hospital and she allowed me to come see her. And she was really fragile and she asked me, to give her a pedicure and um and this is what we did then i i i went and got a we had, she got everything she had a nail cutter she had a basin and i gave her a pedicure and a massage and and that was my last memory and um my life changed that evening because i made many decisions to done knowing that that was my last encounter with with Margaret. So I don't know, I think of my life very much in, um, as an extension of hers, if that makes any sense. Um, so I'm going to read a few poems. Um, it's my way of accessing Margaret and talking to her, um, you know. Eating a life. Cannibal lover, you begin with the lips, eyelids earlobes, moving on to breasts. You bit too hard, down, 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 sucking on a sacred slit, gobbling body parts bit by bit. Arms, legs, fingers, toes, back of neck and even nose. Then you threw the clean bones down upon your plate with a clattering sound. Stated, you began to snow. So much free food. Was it a bore? Sure, I said you forgot this part and offered you a spoon of heart. Not the gardenias. After reading In Invertadero by Cecilia Ortiz. Not the gardenias, not the orchids, not even a bouquet of, fashion, of passion flower would arouse my pale protagonist from her stupor in this novel. I am lost in her gibberish. Her vocabulary blooms in a garden rotten with the compost of lost time and postponement. I'm so bored with it, I don't even bother to turn the page. 
One reason I love Jay. Most of the time, Jay reminds me of a handsome cactus. Then he surprises me, morphs into a Gregory Peck character. That time he flew all the way from New York to San Francisco on the red eye because his mother said she was losing her balance. Even though his sister was two towns away, Jay flew out and slept on his mother's sofa in the studio apartment with his feet hanging over the end. When he took her to the doctor, he held her arm more tenderly than he'd ever held mine, like the broken wing of a beautiful bird. After the examination, the doctor turned to Jay and said, Mother has an inner ear problem. Mother is taking too many aspirins. Mother this and mother that. And Jay said, I prefer you to address your patient directly. She is not deaf. Besides, she is not your mother. And finally, uh, the river. Tonight, we will plunge our feet in the river. We will dress in white orchids and practice the tango. Each step will taste like water. Each dance will be like the fullness of moon. It's true you excused our outlandishness. There is no need for an autopsy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosa. Uh, next, can I please invite uh, Sivagami to come up, please? Um, thank you, Peter. Um, my first memory of Margaret is at Saru's house, where we spent many hours together in the summers of my college years. I first met Margaret in 1983, the year she moved back to India. And she has been my soul sister, mentor, just lots of things. And um, coming to see her in Goa was hard. But I was really happy to see Vanita's ceiling, which reminded me of Margaret's house. Um, I miss Margaret a lot, but going back to her poems was a joy. So I'm going to read two where Margaret was speaking to me. Queen Bee. I beg your pardon, Majesty. When did I, your contemporary queen, agree to be your industrious little worker bee? A consort thus diminished both socially and in her physicality. Pray, who consulted me? No fun until your work is done. I beg to differ, Majesty. Perhaps you are confusing me with this serf or that flunky. And so I do suggest you either put your glasses on or get thee into therapy. The falcon is mine. Oh, spare me that tight sympathetic smile. Don't tell me with your eyes about my inexperience and the illusion of art. I would rather dance on the edge of a cliff at sunset. I would rather color Dali's mustachio over Mona Lisa's smile. Don't try to save me from my desires and dreams, nor even from my demons. I would rather lose the falcon myself than have you tell me it's not mine to lose. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Sadiq, could we have you up next, please? Thanks, Peter. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm just really, really delighted to be here this evening uh, to join all of you um, in the memory of Margaret and to remember her to read from some of her works. Uh, Margaret was a dear, dear friend. Uh, indeed, she continues to be a dear friend because I carry her with me. Uh, she's in my bookshelf, she's in my memories. She lives among my friends who I meet from time to time. So she's very much there. And um, 
this one thing that I want to share about uh, my friendship with Margaret is that as a writer, I can tell you for free that it is a big deal for a writer of any kind of writing, poetry, prose, uh, anything at all, to share their work with another writer. It's a huge deal. And I'm so blessed that Margaret uh, trusted me enough, and I imagine we were friends enough, for her to share uh, one of her novels with me before it was published, uh, The Disappearance of Irene Dos Santos, which I recommend that you get to as soon as you can. It's excellent. And also, of course, uh, a book of poetry, Triage, which uh, I will be reading from this evening. And uh, uh, I also had the pleasure and honor of launching Triage uh, for Margaret at the Sonar Paranta Center, Center for the Arts uh, in Goa in 2013. I shall be reading uh, three works from Triage. The first is Baron. Uh, the second is uh, a piece which I would describe as poetry in prose called Elephant Man. And the third is um, the eponymous uh, poem called Triage. So here we go with Baron. It is not your fault uh, you are who you are. A desert cactus thriving in inhospitable conditions but I had strayed with you too far, too long, drinking dust, eating sand, mesmerized by your mirage, stumbling with blistering feet over scorched earth, walking endless circles around you, planted and holding your stupid barren ground. The second piece is a little long, but I can assure you, you'll enjoy it. It's called Elephant Man. He's wearing that T-shirt again, the gray one with the electric blue cartoon elephant. Its head is marked by an X, cartoon code for wounded. Above the elephant's head is a bubble containing the words, help me. A logo about a square inch in size on the right shoulder lets you know that this shirt and presumably hundreds or even thousands of others just like it are distributed by an environmental NGO. Why the NGO chooses this method of raising awareness about the Thai elephant's existence and its plight is unclear. The nature of the Thai elephant's plight is equally unclear. It leaves me cold, this stupid cartoon, whose pitiful Teletubby cuteness does a profound disservice to a magnificent member of the animal kingdom. If I could get my hands on that t-shirt, I would put it through a shredder, use it as a dust rag, give it to my cat to sleep on. But he wears it every day, all day long, ever since his retirement. And he hand washes it every night. It's not as though he has been dispossessed of his home, his family, me. It's not as though he has no choices now that he no longer develops missiles for the government. Yet every day I must see the message emblazoned on his chest. Help me. And I want to ask him whether he knows the difference between a man and an elephant. And finally, to triage. There should be triage for spirits broken in the war of love. There should be euthanasia for hearts too wrecked for loving. There should be state funerals for words whose abject poverty is an outrage. Thank you. Thank you, Sudeep. Uh, Ishani, could we have you next, please? Hi, everyone. Um, I knew Margaret for a few years, and I think there was an intensity to the friendship, and I think that there was an intensity to Margaret, so it's inevitable. Um, she rescued me, literally, from... 
I was stuck in a place in Baga and and she said, you're not staying there, you're staying with me. And she drove an hour and a half from Alduna and came and picked me up and took me to her house. And I stayed with her a few times. She took me down the road to meet Maria and uh, we have a lot of friends in common. And I think Margaret for me was this incredibly fierce uh, person who was not afraid to and loved her for that. But she was also incredibly tender. And um, I chose poems uh, which, um, which have that tenderness. I mean, um, I think of her a lot. I miss her. I didn't get to see her because I was away uh, for a long time. And uh, so part of me still thinks that when I go to Goa, she'll be there in the house with her dogs and everything will will be as it was and so I don't know in some ways poetry writing um, allows uh, for those for those time lapses and for those meetings so this is uh, the first poem from triage it's called sleepwalker I forgot to water the anthuriums and you walked rivers while I slept why did you walk with only darkness and mist? Travel clutching the dead flamingos. I place my mouth over yours to siphon your infinite sadness. I wrap my arms around you to confine my impossible fright. This is how it is when you have loved for a thousand years. This next poem. Um, it's called These Days. These Days, after reading Other Colors by Orhan Pamuk. These days I only read novels about love. Love found, love lost, love broken, love diminished but intact. And that greatest feat of fiction, a credible tale of love regained. I am looking for directions retracing my steps, pause back, wandering the labyrinth of my history, which is also my prison. I am plagued by questions that wake me in the middle of the night. Should I have fought harder, surrendered sooner, demanded more, settled for less, cut it out, developed a strategy, given more, withheld more? When I feel my head will explode, I stop analyzing. I revert to sensory memory, the sound, sight, touch, smell, taste of love. Why do I search for mirages in the desert of my heart? I hanker for a place where I can breathe freely. I am looking for the simple pleasure of sharing morning light. I am hunting the precise moment when the smile began to fade. Perhaps this quest will reveal this country with unwavering loyalty, not understanding that my own territory had been colonized. Um, and this last little poem, which is called Guarded. I try to protect my lovers. They have been after each other with seemingly innocuous questions from the start. Tell me everything, tell me everything, they say as casually as possible and sulk when I will not. They are wary of me. They are wary of the one I won't let go. Thank you very much, Tishani. Uh, next, we have uh, Vinita, please. Things that I learned the most from Margaret, I learned when I finally heard that she was, it was the last bit of her life. And I've never seen anyone walk to the, towards death with such dignity, with such compassion, because she was comforting us. So yes, uh, Margaret was 
extremely special. And I think she really, really proved that in that last, last few months that we had with her. I've never seen anyone like that. I've never seen anybody walk the last mile with such, such incredible honesty. Uh, I'm reading Sandwiches and Platitudes. Give me your heart, you said, and I will feed you with sandwiches and soothing platitudes. Give me your nights, and I will festoon them with ghosts and performing circus animals. Give me your hand, and I will lead you to a place where only trolls and demons dwell. Give me your spirit, and I will show you a hundred ways in which it can be broken. How's that for entertainment? And instead of a second poem, I thought I'd just read you the author's note that heads this collection of poems because that's Margaret speaking directly to us. A wise man once counseled me, never fall in love with a lover. Not that I followed his advice. Falling in love might be a choice to allow the heart to drive both body and spirit, but all who have risked it bear its scars. Being in love is war. When wounded, some of us withdraw from the battlefield. Others crash and burn only to rise from the ashes and engage in battle again. When a relationship does survive, romantic loves, fever, games, jealousies, politics, betrayals, heartbreak, it is because two people decide they aren't going to give up on each other. It's a different kind of love then. The choice to forgive transgressions against the human heart is the antidote as well as the antithesis to obsession. Writers and artists have a backup cure, writing and art. Triage, the title of the poem that anchors this collection, originated during World War I, when French doctors treated battle, treating battlefield casualties evolved a means of categorizing victims for treatment, which has become standard in paramedic emergency response situations. First, those likely to survive regardless of what care they receive. Then, those likely to die regardless of what care they receive. And then, those for whom immediate treatment might enhance chances of survival. This collection is part of a body of writing culled from journals over the past seven years, consisting of cross-gender and cross-genre poems, flash pieces, and sketches. That's Margaret talking to us about her work, and even though she's gone, her work is still talking to us. I thought you'd like to see the cover of the book as well. This is the cover of Margaret's collection of poems. Thank you. Thank you, Vinita. Uh, next to be Urvashi, Can you hear me? Yes, you're good, Urvashi. Please go ahead. All right. Um, Margaret was a friend of my family, and uh, I was considerably younger than her, and I think that colored the effect that she had on me because um, I really did look up to her. I thought that she had a generosity of spirit that was very, very rare. She had a warmth that touched so many people, irrespective of how well she knew them. Um, she operated from a base level of grace that I really don't see in a lot of people. And she was fearless in a small place. I think there's always the temptation to do what's convenient and do what's easy, but she didn't give in to that. And I saw that time and time again. And yeah, I. I really miss the example that she held. I'm going to be reading two of her poems. The first one is called Body Speak. The smooth and perfect topography of your back, so inviting yesterday, today emits a toxic vibration, unsafe camping ground. Moist expanse of skin, velveting over Lilliputian hillocks of spine. Creaming blade of shoulder, rippling of muscle. A former terra firma, committing perjury, speaking flagrant, contempt of courtship. Are back so fickle then, as hearts, thoughts, words, yours? This next one is a small poem called The Raven and the Golden Crow. Said the golden crow to the raven, what is your plan? Where will you go? What will you eat? What will you do? Why do you ask, the raven replied. I like to imagine you.
Thank you very much, Uvish. Uh, we'll just take another stab right now at playing that video for you. Delangela Roy uh, couldn't be with us because uh, she was dealing with a family health situation. But she recorded this poem, and I put together some pictures to run along with it. Uh, Harish, could you play it, please? Harish, I'm not hearing any audio. Can you see the video though? Can you see the video? No audio. Okay, just one minute. In one of her last conversations before she died, Maggie said with some satisfaction to me, I lived well. I juiced that orange. And so she did. Maggie, this is for you. From triage, her first collection of poems, the end of the world. The first symptom, a breakdown of will, followed by lethal silences, pointed stairs, powers of turning temper. Mangled metal and broken glass can more precisely describe our terminal illness. I still remember the gap between your teeth, the way you look in your painting clothes, your antique compass collection, your eyes. I still remember you drunk and appropriating someone else's stage, wagging your finger of doom, telling the audience, stop your grinning. Don't you know it's the end of the world? I remember the shock timing. I remember Thank you, Prakriti, and thank you, Peter, for bringing all of us friends of Molly around the virtual kitchen table. Maggie was not shy about love and loving and loving, and she had a great deal of love in her life. It was one thing. Dear Anne, I just realized that I never said your name when you were in Maybe I thought it would be less seductive, although thought isn't really the right word, since I never consciously considered it until this very moment. How I never quite made the transition in words, from stranger to lover, even though the conversion had been accomplished long ago. For me, fucking, which is surely what it was, enhanced the distance. After all, we'd agreed, no strings. It seems silly now, ironic even, how I always found ways to never actually address you by your name, how instead I called you nothing, just got your attention by moving into your line of vision and talking. Whenever you left a message on my voicemail, you would say, hello, this is M. Call me back, please. Here's how I left messages on your voicemail. Hi, it's me. I'll see you later. I suppose I knew less about you than about the sense of you, the feeling of you. Sometimes I wish I'd asked what you were thinking that day when I opened the door to your office without knocking and found you with your head in your hands. You recovered so quickly, I almost thought I'd imagined it. Maybe you would have liked being on the receiving end of the conversation once in a while. Perhaps I should have gotten involved after the diagnosis, as your body began to betray you in so many different, and I suspect frightening ways. The fact that you never, in 10 years, introduced your children to me, lent such a surreal quality to the funeral, all three of us cautiously eyeing one another, not knowing what to say. For myself, I wanted to be spared the burden of talking at all. I didn't, for example, want to say, I'm sorry for your loss to strangers at a time when I felt the loss was all mine. There was your son trying to coat his feelings with an arrogant, bitter humor that made me queasy. And your daughter, all organized and elegant, no maudlin display of emotion on her part. She was in control of herself. I, on the other hand, wept openly in the middle of the street. Later, when I complimented her on her management of the funeral arrangements, she said too brightly, well, presentation is everything, isn't it? Okay, I guess I can understand why you kept me away from them. A month earlier, you said, you took so long to come back. True, 
six months is a long time in cancer terms. Thank you for writing that letter of recommendation. Thank you for driving me to the hospital that time I cut my finger chopping tomatoes for the salsa. Thank you for playing the piano so beautifully. It bothers me that I didn't offer to cook dinner for you before I left the last time, the day we had perfunctory sex after the minor argument about the car. Why didn't I pay attention when you casually mentioned you had been feeling tired for several weeks? It was so out of character for you to complain. They say proverbs are rooted in truth, but it is not better late than never. I'm sorry I listened to your son when he turned me away at the hospital saying you wouldn't want anyone to see you like that. I wasn't anyone. He would have let me in if I'd insisted, if I'd mentioned the tiger claw just under my left breast. It has been over a year now, and I still miss you. Sometimes I pick up the phone, dial, and listen to the phone ring. It is nice to pretend for a while that you have just stepped out for the afternoon. Thank you for that, Nilanjana, and I hope you'll be able to watch this later. Uh, in the process of going through alphabetically, I'm a little kafafa in the beginning. I forgot that I was supposed to read at some point. Uh, I have one poem, which is not in triage. It is something that Margaret wrote as part of a uh, on a poetry at Sangam, where uh, it was about poets and their mothers. Uh, I knew Margaret as uh, as we like to say when we were meeting other people together, as the first person who hired me and the first person who sat me. Uh, I worked with her in a magazine in Bombay, uh, where which required people to come in at 9.30 in the morning. And as anybody who knows me, 9.30 in the morning is not a good time. Uh, so the accountants got after her, and but I continued to write for the magazine, and we continued. We lost touch after I left. It was not the years of the internet. And we got back in touch in the early, in the mid-2000s, uh, thanks to uh, the internet, thanks to the Jaipur Literature Festival, and then finding that we had uh, several other friends in common. Uh, is something that I was saying to Rosa and to Urvashi separately, is that Margaret had this knack of friendships across geographies, and friendships across age groups, across interests. And it's very often that, you know, it's, uh, it's quite easy to not know all of Margaret's friends, unless you are perhaps family. Uh, and so actually when I was putting this together, I'm, I really am not sure whether there were more people I could reach out to, but I you know, was able to get what I could. I'm reading this particular poem because it's about her mother. And I met Milana when I was spending time with Margaret in the month before she passed. And Milana and I, yeah, I, I think of Milana as Margaret's gift to me because we've become friends now. And this is a poem called Helicopters and Lace. It is her father, not her mother, who chooses her toys, airplanes, race cars, trains, and helicopters. It is her father who chooses her clothes, diaphanous fairy ballerina dresses, patent leather shoes, socks of lace made by nuns that tie just above chubby knees. Her mother thinks children, irrespective of gender, should have pets, climb trees, and wear comfortable, sturdy play clothes. No, says her father, she should wear only dresses. In winter, tights and leggings are allowed, except when they are visiting her American grandparents on the farm. Her father, outnumbered by in-laws, relents. Even he understands that delicate lace and frills make no sense if his daughter is going to be riding around on a tractor and milking cows with her grandfather or digging carrots in the garden with her grandmother or riding in front of her mother on horseback outside his purview. He is not a sportsman. So finally, her mother has a chance. She must catch her opportunities, if only fleeting, whenever she can, in order to build her daughter who might fly helicopters when she grows up. That's the end of the readings we have for today. If there are any uh, 
uh, questions from the audience. We'll take a few minutes to answer them. You need to put them in uh, chat if you do. And I'm leaving a little note here for those of you who would like to keep in touch with Prakriti. Okay, since there do not seem to be any questions, I'm very glad to see that Ranveer is here. And uh, since it was Ranveer and Mira who came up with this idea, I'm hoping that Ranveer will be able to say, will also say a few words to conclude. Hi, Ranveer. Hey um, I don't know if I'm visible and visible audible. And audible. Both. Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you all for being here today. Um, I've just come back the last weekend from Goa and I can't tell you how much I felt the presence of Margaret every day that I was there with the people I met and the places I went to. I also was uh, not aware of her passing and her illness, so it came to me as a shock much later. Um, and I think it's still going to take me some more time to process it as we all are doing so ourselves. But her work carries on, her indomitable spirit. And uh, I just guess we the living just have to remember her through her words and her energy. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. So could everyone turn on, uh, all of us on the panel, could you please turn on your video for just a second so I can take a screen grab as a keepsake? Meera, Harish, you too. Thank you, folks. And, uh, Thank you, everyone who attended today. It was uh, lovely of you to make time on the weekend. Uh, thank you to everyone on the panel who uh, spoke today of Margaret uh, for making the time for selecting poems and for juggling your lives around in different time zones, uh, some of you, and with other issues to deal with as well. And thank you, uh, Ranveer and uh, Mira and Harish for hosting this. It was beautiful. I'm I, it was just lovely to be able to get the chance to pay this little tribute to Margaret. Thank you, everyone. And uh, Prakriti will be back next weekend with the continuation of Manjula uh, retrospective, a year-long retrospective of Manjula Padmanabhan's plays, adaptations for the, uh, the video screen. Uh, so next weekend is going to be the next of the of that series. And then in the first Saturday of uh, February, the poetry starts up again, the first three Saturdays of every month. Uh, so we do hope you'll be back. Uh, I pasted in the details of how you can keep in touch with Prakriti. So uh, please take a moment to just copy and paste that if you want to uh, you know, sign up on any of these things. And uh, thank you everyone. And uh, join me for a second, just saying, here's to Margaret and we miss you. Bye-bye.